So this is our, uh, our Monday afternoon oh, no. work session. Here. Oh, it's going to work really well. New technology for recording. Uh, we'll go around for introductions. Uh, it's good to see everybody here today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, we'll have a presentation. And as I say, uh, uh, we switch gears from our history in the past of just being able to meet socially, uh, just for the recording and being able to have a remotely accessible meeting. So that's what we're doing here. So uh, yeah, Nick, we'll go around. Great, I'm Nick Lemack, Deschutes County Administrator. Lee Randall, uh, Deschutes County Facilities Director. Alicia Harriet, Circuit Court Judge. Brandy Miller, Circuit Court Judge. Allison Emerson, Circuit Court Judge. Patty Dare, Deschutes County Commissioner. Alicia Sakura, Circuit Court Judge. And Tony Devon, Commissioner. There's only three commissioners here today, so be good to us. There's no one in the room. Hi. Well, it's Ashby, Presiding Judge. Uh, Megan Flynn, Chief Justice. Nancy Cozine, State Court Administrator. Bill Chang, Deschutes County Commissioner. Great question, Circuit Court Judge. Michelle McKeever, Circuit Court Judge. Beth Bagley, Circuit Court Judge. Yeah. Whitney Hale, Deputy County Administrator. Eric uh, Croft, Deputy County Administrator. Kim Rayway, Assistant Legal Counsel. Dan Doyle, Ms. Blotchface, County Counsel. Blotchface is from the dermatologist. I was not in a bar fight, contrary to the rumors. You may have all heard. I have been in a bar fight. Yeah. I've been in a bar fight. Andy Curtis, Trial Court Administrator for Circuit Court. And Judge Clinton had a hearing. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll, yeah. Well, let's just say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, a little bit of relationship building, a little bit of status on what's going on. So thanks for joining us in our uh, building here. Maybe about two years from now, we could be in a building, a new building. That would be very nice. We look forward to that. We really appreciate the patience of our uh, two newest judges who uh, move around every day and have, uh, I was in uh, Judge Harry's office the other day and it was maybe triple digits. It was a little warm. And, uh, so they've been fantastic. And uh, we really appreciate uh, what the county is uh, doing to support the, uh, you know, the courthouse expansion. And of course, the county's grown tremendously and, and this will really help the county uh, deliver justice moving forward for uh, decades. So thank you. Great. Uh, so yeah, with that, we Randall facilities. And he's had quite a day today, I think. So, <laughs> how, many, how many emails and phone calls can I get at one moment, right? Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here this evening to share a status update on the courthouse expansion project. Um, I have about 10 slides. I'll move through them fairly quickly. Um, for those of you who have seen the floor plan and elevations uh, previously, there uh, aren't a lot of changes to update you on, um, but we'll mainly focus on the status of the project and next steps and where we're headed going forward. You can blame the power out. It's like it's covered all day. All right. So, um, just a quick uh, overview of the project scope. Um, the goals are to increase the, the courtroom count uh, for short term and future growth, expand and consolidate court administration, uh, improve the security screening area. Uh, improve in custody holding and transport. Um, overall, it's three levels uh, plus the basement area and 53,000 square feet plus or minus. Um, since uh, since I created this slide, we've, that number has actually been reduced. We're, we're closer to about 50,000 square feet. I'll just briefly walk through the floor plan. Uh, about the right half of um, of the screen there, this area is the new expansion area. Um, to the left, it's the current uh, jury assembly room and area and hearing room. Um, so this is the existing building and this uh, portion here is the expansion. So this is the basement area shows judges secure parking and uh, Sally Port for in custody transfer. On the first floor, the expansion area again is on the right side of the screen. 
uh, showing mainly the administration area and public service counters. Uh, we're also uh, including or including in the project in the existing building is a remodel of this area uh, into a hearing room as well as additional administrative staff offices. And then going to a typical courtroom set uh, on the second floor, um, on the right, uh, we have the two courtrooms with uh, judges chambers and uh, support areas around the outside and then uh, in custody transport in the center um, with elevator uh, for in custody uh, going from the basement um, to uh, currently the second floor and eventually the third floor. So this is the a rendering of view from the west, uh, slightly uh, from the north, you can see the existing building on the left, and then the uh, proposed expansion on the right. One of the uh, challenges that the design team faced, um, and I'll touch basically on the, uh, or, uh, I'll touch a little bit on the solution, uh, was that we have a 1940 building, we have a 1977 building, we have a 2003 expansion, and now we are in 2023 with another expansion. So early on, uh, the design approach was to not try and meld all of those, but just kind of acknowledge these are all different areas of architecture, similar to what we have in the rest of uh, downtown Bend. Um, typically, as you walk up and down Bond or Wall Street, every 50 to 100 feet, there's a new era, different type of architecture. And so the, the design approach early on was just to embrace that and to do the same thing for uh, the courthouse project. This is the view from the Southwest. Um, and there on the left, one of the, you'll see the new uh, security screening area and main entry. Um, one of the challenges with the existing building uh, was a short area uh, for people waiting to go through screening. And so we, this will significantly increase the amount of space for folks that are in line waiting to go through and also bring them into the building at street level rather than coming up exterior steps or a ramp to get into the building. Um, and you'll see that shortly. Um, and, then and then again, from on the outside, this shows uh, they're hard to see in the rendering, but at the lower right um, and, and the street level of the proposed building is where the judge's entrance will be. This is the view of Harriman Street, um, as well as the Sally Park entrance. This is a, a rendering of the courtroom. Many of you were at the, the mock-up where um, the feedback and information that the design and construction team got was incorporated into um, the courtroom design that you see here. And this is that expanded screen area and the entry area at street level. Um, one of the design features that I really like is the incorporation of, of timber framing into just this area. Um, it's cost prohibitive to do on a large scale, but we wanted to find a way to bring in that Pacific Northwest look, something that um, harkens back to Ben's roots as a mill town um, and really um, highlight that as folks come into the into the building as well as creating uh, a warmer entry uh, with the wood tones um, to kind of set the tone as folks um, come to, to do business. We're almost to the, to the end of the update. I'll uh, touch briefly on where we're at in terms of project development. Um, we're currently uh, at the bid and permit stage there in yellow. Um, we show that running through September, from September through March. Uh, we just had a, a follow-up meeting with the city today. Our planning application is nearing completion. We've, we've done an initial submittal to the city. We received comments back. We're in the process of responding to those comments. And as part of that response, uh, we met with City of Bend Engineering um, today to work through some of their comments uh, and feedback on specifically on the Harriman Street side, um, just looking at some of the details related to the width of the proposed street, the improvements that we'll be doing as part of the project. So we are providing, and it, the meeting actually went really well. We were able to work through some of their concerns and come up with what we think is a solution. So we'll be uh, um, resubmitting um, an additional um, some additional documents with additional information probably early next week to respond to their concerns um, related to the Harriman Street. Uh, we expect 
our goal is to uh, have a preliminary uh, permit for demo and for site work uh, beginning as early as the first of the year. Um, there's still some, some things to work through. One is that this planning application has taken a little longer than we expected. And so um, we're experiencing some delays there. And then we're still, we're continuing to work through uh, the AJ Tucker building removal. Um, the Board of Commissioners has approved um, our application to submit to remove the building and save the facade for potential future use. And so we're moving forward with that application. Uh, we have a draft of it that um, will be uh, working through this week, the end of this week and early next week, um, and looking to submit that to the city, possibly to have our mandatory uh, public hearing either in November or December, uh, depending on, on how that application process goes. Um, and then hopefully we'll be off and running with construction administration and looking to actually be breaking ground likely now in April um, with uh, actual footing excavation and, and all the rest of it that goes into the building of both. So I believe that takes us and I'll stop. I'm happy to answer any questions though. We're excited to be able to put this together. Uh, uh, it, it was about a $25 million estimate that slipped to 40 during these inflationary times. Uh, state legislature provided basically that $15 million number is, is exactly what we needed. And I'm sure there was probably some advocacy from your point of view, whatever could be done there. And Commissioner Adair, she was very- No, it was Judy Trigo. Yeah. Senator Steiner loves Judy Trigo, and that's the friend that went with me. So she smiled and said, yes, yes, yes. Polk County didn't even get $22,000. There were eight counties that didn't get a dime, and everyone was going, why did Shoots get so lucky? Judy Trigo. I'll give all the credit to her. We'll sign the card for um, our, And our legislative delegation from yeah. the Central Oregon region was also pretty important in that. Well, and it's statewide significance. Uh, you know, being able to kind of Eastern Oregon have that capacity. We have the judges now, so it's good to be able to build this building. And, you know, thank you for the professionalism of uh, your community uh, and your group uh, and the partners that are coming online for this, too. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of professional services rendered right now to put this together. Uh, for sure, and the, you know, the county the board of uh, county commissioners has a, always been a, a fine stewards of um, the courthouse. I think that that has really helped, and we've always um, had excellent facilities. And the county stepped up, and said, "Hey, we can, you know, we will fund this." And I just think it really showed some leadership. I think that connected, you know, in the legislature. And I do want to um, mention Lee. You know, we we've, we've been um, working together through the RFP, you know, process and constantly impressed by the county participants and really feel that we have the right people in the room, so to speak, to see this project through, you know, you, you go through that and then, you know, uh, the county awards those contracts and, and then you wonder like, okay, you know, this is the right group. And I really have a lot of confidence and the ability for them to deliver a great project. Well, their name is right across the street. So if there's a problem- You know, it doesn't hurt, right? So one of those renderings, um, what is it, Pence? Mm -hmm. spread across. So it's like yes. they have to look at that project every day. So they were they're gonna do a great job. That's it. That's it. And on behalf of the OJD as a whole, we're just really grateful for the county's partnership in this effort. Glad to see that it's close to fruition. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're we're very appreciative uh, to OJD and others at the state level for um granting us two additional judges which you know all these things feed together so next on the agenda so business can go wherever we want we've just got some time together uh really talking about uh say mental health and public safety <clears throat> two big topics right so uh but what can we do to work together advocate for the next things that need to happen there uh, i know that uh uh, aid and assist and you know, measure 110 and just all kinds of variables around this. So I don't know if anybody was kind of leading the conversation on this or we're just dropping it on the table. So I do the mental, oh, okay. I do the mental health court yes. in Deschutes County and um, our numbers have stayed pretty steady this last year, about 45 open cases. We're up, we were up 115% shortly after measure 110 came about and we've stayed pretty steady. The law has been 
ever really evolving in this area with the federal case pending and Judge Mossman's orders. So it's changed some of what we can and can't do as it talks about um, either leaving people in the community or finding other placement for them. I think one of the things that's really missing in this analysis is something in between community placement and the Oregon State Hospital. Deschutes County only has 17 beds total um, at the Deschutes Recovery Center. So we're regularly getting cases that are coming through. People are recommending a secure residential treatment facility. There's no placement for them. So they're being released back into the community or they're coming back from the Oregon State Hospital as either unable to, una still unable to aid and assist, but they've timed out and there's no placement for them. So we're placing them back on community restoration. A lot of them don't even have the mental capacity to participate in community restoration. So you're trying to get them to participate with the kind of behavior health. And then ultimately you're most likely dismissing their cases because there's no engagement. So what we're kind of seeing as a pattern now is we have people who are coming back who are not restored, who are still experiencing pretty significant mental health issues. And there's really no resources, community resources. And the lift that we're asking from Deschutes County Behavioral Health, who is amazing. Our Deschutes County Behavioral Health team does an amazing job because the things that we're asking them to do, not only aid and assist, but um, the MCAT team, we're worried that they're going to start having to put caps on the number of cases that they can even take on community restoration because we're getting to that capacity threshold. So. What I'd like to see is some other intermediary, whether it's non-secure residential treatment facilities, secure residential treatment facilities, um, other dual diagnosis treatment facilities, because there's really nothing that's existing in the community as it relates to, so aid and assist deals with the people who are in the criminal justice system who aren't currently able to proceed, but then our civil commitment statutes that um, we're up 42.1% in civil commitment filings just in the last year. So I think mental health continues to be one of the big topics that OJD and behavioral health, even before they're dealing with it in the criminal justice system, I expect that these numbers are going to continue to rise. So the Deschutes Recovery Center, I know it was a commitment that it kind of went online when I got involved a dozen years ago, but sort of right before that, so we you know, built that. And I, and I think I remember as it started, you know, uh, 17 beds there right now, uh, it was like, okay, well, this is for people uh, possibly outside of Deschutes County, referring to Eastern Oregon a little bit more. Uh, so, you know, maybe that we need to be looking at that uh, with our partners from across Eastern Oregon. You know, where else could we be? advocating for another facility like that because um, there's well, needs all over and the place. And we are yeah. sending our defendants to community placements outside of Deschutes County as yeah. well, well which is also creating some pushback too. Yeah, But it's, it's, it's kind of looking at the state level. Well, yeah. Where's the next place prime for one? Because that'll help the whole system. But the really good news is Senator Wyden is looking at that rule. It's from 1963, limiting the beds to 16. That's been bugging me for like four years. He is actually meeting. And um, in fact, I left calls with his office yesterday. If we can get that rule bumped up so you can build a hospital with like 80 beds or something, it would make such a difference. And he's very well aware of it. Gina Nichols, who's our associate director, executive director for AOC, is... Um, back in DC a lot working on this issue. So yeah, the rule was from 1963, the 16 beds, and it needs to be changed. And, you know, a, a little bit more than a year ago, we were at a place where uh, the state had allocated some millions of dollars of funding um, that was being held by our behavioral health division and uh, best care, you know, we, we, we all know very well from the substance use disorder treatment and but um uh, but in this case best care was willing to work with us on a secure residential treatment facility and then it all just fell apart um so i, I, I to the best of my knowledge that behavior health is still holding those couple of million dollars um, for this purpose but um finding someone to 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 um, secure the additional funding uh build and operate um, is uh, is a missing piece, um, which uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, Holly uh, Holly Harris, our behavior health director, Jasper, so they they're acutely aware of. Um, and I 
I, I keep asking them whether there's something that we can do to be helpful uh, to, to, to move that along, but it's um, without without that entity that's, that's to step forward to who's willing to, to build and operate it. Um, we're, you, you, know, we, you can only, you can only um, um, it's like pushing a string. <laughs> you, can only, you can only do do so much by pushing a string. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I that's not, I, I know that's not helpful, but um, that's just kind of in the background of some of what's happening. And I, I wish there was something that we could do. And if you have ideas, um, would we would welcome, you know, we would welcome uh, your input on on how we how we break this impasse and we have move forward. Well, we might go back to the funding package that was for the change recovery center and figure out who the players were there because i think once again i think some of the you know general fund and it was debt associated with it uh before my time now that the county ended up writing a pretty good check and providing that our school over there uh so to say maybe just put the model together and figure out what the next step would be oh and i should also add um the county and um was the county and some other entity provided $100,000 a piece. Oh, it was St. Charles. So we actually are really lucky in this county. We just have a local nonprofit that was created called COGAP, mm -hmm. Central mm -hmm. Oregon Guardianship Association. Yeah, yeah, so we, we, we donated here. to them. We well, that right here in this room. Yeah. What I will tell you is their impact is yeah. already being seen That's in great. court. Yeah. We had three cases come back with really, really serious, dangerous charges, an attempted murder, an assault too, and a guy who was DD services. So he was... 20-ish years old, but he had extreme D um, issues. He was being held in the jail for about six months. Six months, and they got involved and had these people, from the day they got involved, within 48 hours, had resolved the issue with them being stuck in the criminal justice system. So they've already made a huge impact. They already, so yeah, they they were got great that. returns on so that. They were able yeah. to connect those people with guardians. Correct. Yeah. So one of them was an attempted murder. He was going to be released back into the community because he was never able. So the statute says if they're deemed never able, the court's required to dismiss their case. He didn't have housing because he had pretty extreme dementia. And there was no one stepping up to, so he didn't qualify for any other guardianship well he didn't qualify for extreme risk and then they came in created the guardianship they are the guardian and got it placed within 24 hours and would those people have been uh, uh would they probably have ended up being aid and assists classified as aid and assist or? so he was on the aid and assist he went to the oregon state hospital he'd been in custody or at the oregon state hospital for about two years and then the state hospital um, made a finding that he was never able able to, able to aid and assist. So then he comes back to Deschutes County Jail, and the statute requires me to dismiss his case unless I can make a finding that there is some probability that he can be found able. So his criminal cases get dismissed, and he gets released back into the community. Yeah. Yeah. Very very serious impact. Any other aspects of this topic? Well, I just wanted to note that you, you probably know that this is a huge problem statewide. Okay. All of our data is showing that um, since Judge Mossman's order, there is a significant increase in the number of people cycling back into the criminal justice system following release because we don't have those local placements. And so I really appreciate the efforts that um, have been made. And I think it's one where when we talk to OHA, and I talk to Gina and Nicole a lot too, um, you know, I think we're all advocating for those local dollars and for the people who can be the experts to run those facilities. This is a particularly difficult population. Um, a lot of entities um, have reluctance to work with this population, the justice involved, um, or the likely to be justice involved. So it probably will take special efforts and continuing efforts, but it's great to hear that you have some models that are working on. Yeah, and it's hard to find placement when they have justice involved, especially if they have assault. Then even if they qualify for some placement, they're not accepting them because they have this violent background. But the violent background is linked to the mental health that they they've stabilized at the Oregon State Hospital, but the places won't still take them. It's it's very difficult. That that, that does remind me. So one of the things um, 
that, that Janice has, has uh, mentioned in the past is, uh, you know, there, there, there is uh, open space at uh, Deer Ridge Correctional Facility. And, you know, we, there's been all kinds of discussions about whether that could be used, uh, you know, uh, as a as, you know, homeless shelter or something like that. Um, which I'm not personally supportive of, but um, Janice has uh, has I, I expressed that there are there might be mandated populations who um, um, you know may be potentially violent. You can set up a small unit, maybe for a couple, like two, three, four people, um, in some of that uh, available space at Jennifer Ridge. Uh, it, it, does that? Then I'll, well, yeah, I mean, your ridge, Juniper I'm sorry, Deer Ridge. Okay. I'm sorry, was I saying Juniper Ridge? Well, time? you did say Deer Ridge. Oh, so then you said Juniper. Okay. I knew what you In meant. Deer Ridge. Um, I mean, would that potentially be valuable to have? I mean, it's not. Well, maybe that is classified as a secure residential treatment facility. But I mean, would it be would it be valuable to have? Uh, you know, potentially. You know, some of the people on the more dangerous or violent end of, of the of the continuum in, in in these special populations. I think that's a really interesting question because I just did a case he had an assault too, and he was then gonna be, they were looking at an extreme risk placement, so he cycled from the Oregon State Hospital back to the jail, and it's the differential in the setting that really made a difference in his. So he stayed on his medication they the our jail was able to give him his treatment exactly like he was getting at the area state hospital he's still decompensated in the jail setting even with them providing the resources that he was getting and so he got sprouted back to the Oregon state hospital while he was awaiting his hearing and he improved so i, I the setting matters i think so they'd have to be really thoughtful about how that was set up i think to rich is actually quite um it's was the nicest prison, according to my conversations with Carl Left Peters. I mean, it's got beautiful land around it. I've been there a couple of times. They actually have an amazing program there with welding for the inmates. They have 12 inmates through COCC that will get out in a year um, with certification. They can make 40 to $60 an hour. And so just met with COCC the other day to see if we can double that program for people so they don't, re you know, go back to their ways of crime. They can actually... Yeah. The inmates I'm talking to, I'm going like, you can actually change your lives with the decisions you're making. So if they can double that program, somebody else wanted to add more education there. But there are so many buildings there that are not being used. Now, Rob Pearson from the State Corrections just did call me and say, Mrs. Adair, we really can't use your idea. The governor's saying that she wants to keep it in case something burns, that we have this half empty jail. But it's it's actually, um, it is really um, a, a lovely location and you know what they're doing with all the programs you want to bring in welding if we can bring in electrical more welding electrical plumbing and then some educational things for people in fact I know a volunteer that wants to go and help people with their life skills so that when they leave they're they can go to, go to the right instead of the left like I just heard from best care today Rick to left and told me he had had 17 people overdose this year um, they had only lost one person before of their patients, um, you know, for years and years and years this year, he said he lost three patients in one week. And it's just horrific people that get out of the jail and they go to the, they should go to the left to their parole meeting and they go to the right and get it yet. And, and it's killing them. So the federal is so bad. So. Anyway, it's just um, one of the complications, but he is incredibly upset. And then of course we've got um, the burn money, um, Ideal Options is here and they're willing to have anybody that wants help to come in there, law enforcement can drop them off right then and there. They're open four days a week, 10 hour days. And they're in Bend and Redmond. So they run a, actually a really good program. And they're saying if they can get someone to consider getting off of drugs, if they can have seven injections, um, some people that will actually keep them off of drugs for 39 months. Those, you know, it's like two, and then it's one a month, and some, you know, it's it has some great potential for helping turn save people's lives. So, I mean, we're real. It's a it's an epidemic right now. 
Well, we sit by the treatment court recently now, huh? So there's one shame there. Um, in fact, uh, so um, District Attorney uh, Gonnells mentioned that uh, when we were at the other night, that, you know, that is the, the gold standard for, for helping people. But, uh, you know, it is with uh, sanctions that are, are being, uh, you know, driving people to the to this court, you know, to the get involved with this treatment court. Uh, so, yeah, anybody want to speak about that? What can we do now? You know, what's the next step to either bring it back or advocate for something? Well, thank you. I am uh, the judge who is presiding over the uh, treatment court, and uh, I can speak to the success of the program. And, you know, 70% of all our grant uh, people who participate in the program at some point graduate from the program. And so, you know, what I tell everyone is that it is service intensive and treatment intensive. And so, you know, part of the understand that I think folks need to have with treatment court is not just substance use disorder treatment. That is what the primary issue is when they come into. Uh, what you call a drug court or a treatment court, but they may have co-occurring disorders, mental health disorders, and it's treated uh, along with the uh, substance use disorder. And a treatment provider would, in fact, figure out which one to treat first or how to treat both of them at the same time. And then they also receive um, services for their criminogenic thinking. So there is a model for how to change the way they trick that they think so that we can introduce them back into society doing the things that uh, are pro-social as opposed to the antisocial way they uh, don't think. Uh, in addition to that, there are services that we provide with regards to you know, their, their just socioeconomic needs. So they may need housing, they need employment, they may need education, they need, they need childcare. Um, and they need peer mentoring. These are all the resources and services that treatment court provides. So holistically, that's why the program works, is because we're trying to address their needs and the risks that they bring into the court. And drug court addresses the needs for high risk, high needs people. And high, high risk generally means that they're uh, they're, they're likely to fail on supervision. And so that's why they're always in jail so because they're constantly failing because of what their needs are. And that's why they're failing on supervision. And so we try to address all of those needs to break that cycle. Um, and so in order to do that, we get, get all our partners together. So we need uh, the district attorney's office on board. We need the sheriff's office on board. We need a treatment provider uh, who is either capable of uh, addressing the substance use disorder under, that's underlying it. And if there's a co-occurring disorder, a mental health provider, if the treatment provider can't do that. So some treatment providers do address uh, mental health as well as the substance use. And if they don't, we have to have a separate provider to do that as well. Um, otherwise, we can't even take them into treatment court because we can't address their needs. Um, and so we also then have to have probation involved, right, because we have to have supervision. Um, and so uh, we have to have peer mentors involved. And, you know, we're, we were fortunate to have all of those services in place. And, and at times we had more than that because we had, for example, CASA. Uh, we have a lot of our... When the treatment court was initially set up as drug court, it was initially set up as a family drug court. And so a lot of those people had dependency cases that were also addressed. And so DHS was involved, CASA was involved, and DHS and CASA are really important resources because they know kind of services that are important in that setting and they provide that. And uh, I know DHS started to struggle with uh, their ability to provide uh, resources to stay in treatment court. They fell off towards the end of our treatment court, which was unfortunate. CASA remained involved for a long time. And CASA is important because they get involved with our children in treatment court and they do the visits and uh, that, that kind of component. We had other attorneys um, 
school. So apart from the criminal aspect of it, provided uh, services to allow for custody uh, and parenting plans to be put in place, which is awesome. We had an independent person uh, foundation, Choose Joy Foundation who also uh, supported the families. So we had lots of resources available to us to help. The major thing that hit us, obviously we lost our treatment provider. I mean, our treatment coordinator first. Technically we, we kind of lost our treatment provider and then, um, but they hung on, kind of continued to provide services. And at one point we lost that treatment provider entirely. And then we, in the midst of that, we lost our treatment coordinator, treatment court coordinator. This program can't run without a treatment coordinator um, because they're the ones who kind of pull everything together, uh, allows for case management, which is crucial to our uh, court without case, ma case management, which is planning and identifying the needs of, of individuals. This really doesn't work. And proper case management was essential and otherwise, you're just basically closing your eyes and throwing darts and hoping to hit the right spot. Um, and so that, in, in conjunction with the treatment provider and proper case management, is kind of what makes this thing kind of works. And on top of that, there is a treatment course is a shift. The way that the model is a shift from how we do traditional court, right? And so a lot of folks come in. Um, with the idea, even our providers, um, initially with the idea that you give someone a chance and there's so many chances that you give someone to be successful. Treatment court is not that. Treatment court dispenses with that model and regardless of how many times you mess up, as long as you're willing to engage in treatment and do the work, we're gonna work with you until you fix the problem or we have more resources. So the onus is on us to kind of help and give the folks, figure out what the needs are and resolve it and get the people to where they need to be. That's a very different model to shift from where, from a punitive model, where if you do what you do, you're good. If you don't do what you do, you're going to jail. This requires training for all of our staff and a commitment from all of our providers and staff to engage in that kind of treatment. NADCP, that's the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, does provide training annually. And our court have, have provided uh, some training as well, but it also requires that commitment from our staff and providers to be involved in that. And it's not a one-time thing, it's ongoing. So that, and this is a lot. <laughs> so this so is what's what the future? Are we going to be able to bring something back around? Well, and, and I say we, you know, what are what resources are needed? So these are the resources that we need, right? And so, so the coordinator, who's, who pays for the coordinator? So I think Angie can speak to. She, she can. <laughs> the funding was provided from a, a grant through the Criminal Justice Commission. Okay. So part, the primary part of the grant went to community corrections. And then the part for the coordinators, the model for the grant evolved over time. And most recently, there was a single grant application. And then the funding for the coordinator came through OJT. And then the remainder of the funding predominantly went to community corrections through a grant. And so the grant, our most recent grant, did end on June 30th of 2023. One of the challenges with hiring coordinators through a grant cycle is that you have to post the position in a limited duration position. And particularly in a place like Bend, when the cost of living is very high, it, you know this, it can be very hard to get people to commit to those kinds of jobs when they don't know at the end of that cycle whether or not they're going to have a job. And so that's a conversation we're having with legislators. And, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping we may have some solutions um, to that problem. That's something we can do from, from our side on the state level. And so we are engaging and, and we'll do everything we can to try to help in that regard. And I, you know, I think um, Commissioner Chang uh, raised a good point. I think one of the things that you know our court can commit to is looking at what happened, you know, with this drug court. You know, we didn't kill a drug court; it died, and for a reason. And we can look at those reasons and say, okay, you know, um, 
And the questions that I have is number one, does it need to live in the court? Because it's incredibly resource intensive. So really looking at it and just saying, hey, we know that we have to provide these services. These services are critical in our community, but what can that look like? And, and I think, it, and it starts with, okay, what did we have? How did it shape shift over the years? You know, we had declining enrollment. And it wasn't all, you know, I, I describe it as death by a thousand cuts. It certainly wasn't for a lack of effort by um, Judge Crutchley. I don't think you could have a better uh, uh, judge who is um, really wedded to the fidelity of, you know, if you if you want a real treatment court, you have to follow the model or, or you're just putting up, um, it's just window dressing. It just looks pretty for the community it can really harm people. So I think we can have that community conversation and just say, Here's what we know we need in our community. It's probably something that's needed in Oregon, right? This is not just either side. You know, there's a treatment issue. There's a drug problem in Shoots County. Don't go there. You know, go to go to another county where there's you know, no drug problem, right? That's a that world that sailed a long, long time ago. And what did we have? And, and how did it? Um, how did we end up at this place Monday where we had the you know the last two graduates? And what would that resource look like? And then what would the court's role, if any? Be in that um, in that so, so are you suggesting that instead of having a uh, having a model where the circuit court is is the coordinator of the process as well as you know providing you know the, the, the judge and, and you know all of the structure that comes with you know um with, with court procedures and legal procedures it, it could possibly be coordinated somewhere else with the, the, the circuit court still providing the judge and the, the kind of procedural framework, but someone else making sure that this whole bundle of other services to address co-occurring concerns, someone else is making sure that all that happens. Is that I, I think it I think it should be explored. You know, we we look at veterans intervention strategies, which came out of the district attorney's office, which was um, highly successful, and we call it a court-connected program. It is not a court program; it's a, a DA's program with a court component, and it's worked very well. Uh, Judge Miller, I can speak that briefly. I was thinking about that as I was listening to this. Um, and I, so, I guess uh, no particular order, but you know that's been out now for about it's just less than a year, maybe about a year. It is. Uh, from our perspective, at the course, very nimble. I, it's about two hours of time, maybe to two and a half a month, from for bench time, literally on the bench, and uh, it might be an extra half an hour, or really fifteen minutes to twenty minutes in meeting with the team before I go take the bench. That's very different than Judge Crushley's uh, Family Drug Court for very different reasons. Um, this is court connected. It is managed by the DA's office. They invited us uh, to be a part of it. Um, to add, I think some, I, I guess I'd say credibility to decision making, uh, allow the judge to make decisions and have the DA make the decisions after they've entered the program. That, they were doing that before, uh, but with our partnership and, and agree, agreement to be a part of this program, they've expanded the number of participants. And so these are people that, uh, these are veterans that have uh, uh, they found their way in through uh, having contact with law enforcement. They face a, a, a charge or two. Uh, they enter a plea. They admit to the crime, and they enter into the program, Veterans, veterans uh, Intervention Strategies Program, and they're sentenced. And then the program is the sentence. Uh, that's different, for example, than a, a DVDSP, uh, where they enter a plea. They may never get sentenced in the court I'm a part of uh, in this program. They're sentenced, and the judge all of a sudden uh, meets with them every couple of weeks, maybe once a month, depending on the schedule, and it's a handful, and then they rotate. We've got about eight, 17, 18 applicants right now. One of them's undecided, or not undecided. He wants to come in, but it's, actually that's part of it. They're, they're, uh, they're looking at his background and decide if he's, in, if he's eligible, uh, and they come in, and uh, uh, my role is, is I, I see them in court. I make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, so what does that look like? Unlike Judge Crushley, uh, I have, uh, uh, you've got the vet center, you've got 
uh, veteran mentors. Uh, there are rules around this program that uh, they can speak to the mentors. Mentors don't have to share what they said and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a different kind of program. Uh, and again, I should have mentioned if it's not apparent if I didn't say it, should have. If, to be eligible, you have to serve in the military. It has to be an eligible crime, meaning not your most serious crimes. Uh, it has to, uh, th th their issue, their service-connected issue has to relate to the crime that they've committed. So it has to be this nexus. Uh, there's lots of people that serve in the military that committed a crime and the two don't have anything to do with each other, okay? Um, but I would say from a resource perspective, it's really no more than what I just described. I'm honored to be a part of it. I'm amazed by it. I'm, I'm humbled by the participants, but it doesn't take more than that from the court's perspective. The vet center steps in. We've got a, a VA uh, and... Uh, and Klamath, uh, they're all participating. No one, no one's getting paid that that isn't that wasn't already getting paid. Uh, and it, it's a, a very uh, flexible and nimble program that allows the court to be involved in a way. I would dare say that maybe you you wouldn't be uh, able to to uh, to be involved in if you were in a formal veterans treatment court. Um, so it was a no-brainer for us to get involved and uh, uh, for me to be involved. Uh, but I'm really not doing, to be fair, uh, the, it's the DA's office, the defense bar, uh, the veterans and, and all those uh, veteran lawyers, veteran, they're, they're all doing the work. And my decisions at the end of the day come down to, uh, uh, do you uh, do you stay in the, do you, did you do what you're supposed to do while you know, you're, you're on these two tracks as a part of your sentence or not? And then I would say there's similarities. Um, we work very hard, uh, or at least think very hard about encouraging them. It's not a lot of work, but uh, at least not yet. Uh, Judge Crushley has only been in there for a year, but uh, to keep them going and uh, encourage them to be successful. Uh, that's that's two different, totally different programs. One's, it just doesn't require a lot of us as, as a judge to be involved in this. But what I appreciate about what Judge Ashby was pointing out is that uh, he said we should explore different options related to what was the family drug court if the resources are not necessarily there or if they're not there yet. Um, there may be ways to be nimble and to have other partners that do a lot of the work. Um, I, I certainly won't speak to that. Judge Crushley probably has some ideas on, on this. He's been doing this forever. And, uh, uh, and I don't know what you know. And, uh, and I'm just learning about what I'm doing, but but I like the idea of being uh, open-minded about how you might accomplish some goals uh, rather than have it all or nothing. Um, I think that's important. So anyway, that's and, and I, can I raise it not because um, you know, hey, how can the court get out of work? Um, it's really quite the opposite. We just have um, so many people who need access to justice. We have you know family dependency. We have. Um, uh, family law, criminal, probate, uh, juvenile, and and so it's you know, every time you know we make a decision to do this, um, we're we're not doing something else. And so it's just I'm just saying like let's just have a real broad look at this and see what what the court's role uh, can and should be. And there are, I mean, you know, within 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 the county family, there are. A number of agencies that have a vested interest in having this kind of a, a pathway or a track available to, to people who are in, involved with the criminal justice system and have had, you know substance use disorder challenges. I mean, you know, community justice, and behavioral health being the immediate two that, that come to mind. So, um, which then you know led me to the. Uh, so how do we pay for it? <laughs> question. Um, and I, I do think, you know, uh, part of the reason I, I'm uh, particularly interested in, the, in, in this question, these issues right now is because there is so much, uh, there's so much discussion of Measure 110 reform uh, that kind of bubbling up right now. I, I think it's going to be a really central focus of the, the short legislative session and um, for us to be able to, to 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 explain to people, you know, this is what uh, adult treatment court 
is or was, and this is why it worked, you know, why in Deschutes County it worked so well, because I am getting the impressions speaking to other county commissioners that it doesn't actually work well in all counties. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's a, that's a credit to all of you who, you know, you know, have this high fidelity program that, that, that delivered the model in an effective way. Uh, but, you know, well, what does it do? Why did it work here? And um, you know, what resources are needed um, to to have support this this service? Um, and you know, maybe there could be a fourth piece to to, to that, which is kind of what are what are some potentially slightly different models or structures um, to, to offer it. And I think if we can do that, if we can put that put that in writing, you know, in a case study in a white paper or something like that, that that's an incredibly valuable thing to contribute to the the statewide discussions of you know measure 110 reform right now so I, I, um the, the idea came up to 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 ask uh, you know from uh, councillor broadman uh to 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 i uh, um ask the lipsic uh to to somehow be involved in producing that that paper, um, and I, I don't know whether that's, you know, I've only sat on the lips for a short period of time. Um, some of you who've been more involved with it for longer can, can tell me whether that, that seems like a good idea or not, but um, I get, somehow producing this white paper, I think would be, uh, I, I do think would be an incredibly valuable thing to contribute to the discussions, the policy discussions that are happening right now. I think, I think Lipstick's a great ecosystem to, you know, bring that up and um, discuss that, maybe come up with a plan to execute that. Um, one thing that Judge Kirchley brought up was CASA, and Heather Deal just gave a presentation this afternoon, how timely, at my health council meeting. She actually said in Central um, Oregon, we have an 85% um, relationship with CASAs, and which is normally state average is 50%. So, uh, I told her to please come again to the county and do her presentation so we can bring more volunteers. But the fact that they're at 85% is really so significant. I think she does such a great, great job. Um, you know, clearly those those children need someone that's going to really be their advocate. Someone apparently served for 10 years with one um, one child that just it, the case just went on and on and that that cost of person stayed with them so just think what kind of continuity it gave to that um you know to give it to that person that really gave them more hope that there's really somebody that really cares and then the other person is heather doherty who ran um yam hill's um drug court problem and she, um uh, let's see ideal uh, options just hired her away from yam hill a couple uh, weeks ago, but she has two daughters that live here in bed, 20 year old daughters. And so um, when I met her at the other day at Ideal Options too, she is, um, you know, nationally certified and everything. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's somebody that we could bring in um, to help if we could ever pull our program back together again or not, but she definitely had um, the expertise and she has two kids here. So, that, you know, it could be a win-win, right? Like, I'm sure Josh would be um, not happy with me, but she was, um, it was great to get to meet her and think that she made that special trip over. So, yeah. One of the other things I would have to say, addressing one of the subjects that Commissioner Chan brought up was the cost of treatment. Okay? And so it's not just getting our folks into treatment, the providers actually are committing to doing extra work. And this is why I think Judge um, is asking for a different model. Because part of what adult treatment work requires as part of their program is that there be um, team meetings and case management meetings. So your treatment providers show up outside of their facilities. They come to court and they provide they participate in team meetings and participate in case management. It's time consuming. Mm -hmm. And so they have to have a commitment and get paid to do this. And right now, I think the message is, why do we commit to doing this when we make as much money just doing what we're doing? So 
that has to be fixed, right? So they 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 don't necessarily want to take additional time to come to court to meet with a team, case plan, case management, report. That's extra for them to mm -hmm. do. Yeah, billable hours plus. Right. Plus the overhead. Right. One of the one of the reasons I, I think it's really great to bring the you know to kind of put these kinds of treatment courts front and center during the measure 110 reform discussions is there is a you know measure 110 has deployed a substantial amount of funding for treatment in the past and that hasn't been going to treatment courts as far as I understand you know that, that's not something that um, the money that's flowing through the PHRNs is, is going to so I, I mean I think that there's an opportunity if we if we really understand what the resources are that are needed um, to uh, you know run a robust successful uh, treatment court then we can be asking for that at this at this moment while people are looking under the hood of measure one hand and tinkering with it. I think Nancy may have a better understanding than I have that understanding. They never carved out anything specific for treatment courts at measure one ten. Treatment providers, I think, could write something up on their own, but I, I, it was never a, a carve out specifically for a treatment court. Right. I think there are some pretty active discussions on this topic happening now in the legislature. So we'll see. Yeah. And then if, the, if the, the program is coordinated from outside of the circuit court, then you know maybe that makes it easier to um, frame it as a treatment option than you know, it's closer to what they're funding under Measure 110 currently. And I, I don't know. Yeah, well, oh, yeah, this, this short session will be real important to get up to speed. Being able to communicate about this as it's happening will be valuable. Probably moving on a little bit here. So, sure, public defense services. Public defense services, I'll give a quick breakdown. We have See one person in custody um, who is unrepresented but would otherwise be held. Um, and we do have a plan for representation. We should have more information in about a week. Um, and then we have one person out of custody um, currently unrepresented as a result of um, you know coming back on uh, post-conviction relief. So that's the that's the good news. Um, what I would say is. You know, I, I think, you know, we have had conversations early and often um, with the district attorney's office, with all of our public defense service providers. We are, you know, blessed to work with um, public defense service providers who, uh, you know, kind of follow what I think is the Central Oregon way of collaboration. Um, they, they are um, not leveraging this moment to um, get anything for them. They are, are always just saying, how can we help? And so uh, typically in the room is our district attorney. Um, all of our defense service providers, you know, obviously the court, our uh, court administrator, and we just say, what do we need to do, um, you know, to to make this work? And so, on the court side, we've made a lot of changes in our business practices. We just said, hey, if you do this, or if you extend this timeline, or if we don't have to file a motion for something we're setting over a week, and you know, we're looking at ways to reduce their case down, we're looking at ways to uh, make the work that we do more efficient for them. A lot of that includes uh, staying uh, remote so they can work at their desk until they hear their case called, they can jump in. You know, little things like not having to walk to the courtroom in the courthouse. Um, so, you know, that collaboration, uh, Rep Prep's been a part of that. Um, we, you know, uh, family, uh, family leave, uh, the Oregon Family Leave Act is, um, you know, is, is great and it's important. And it also, you know, pulls a few attorneys offline every now and then. Um, hiring has there have been some hiring successes, which is really encouraging because um, you know everybody is. Um, it's like you know, uh, bring your own home. It's very very difficult for people to uh, move here, especially new attorneys who you want to attract to, you know, public defense. Um, and so you know, hearing those hiring successes is um, fantastic. But I, I'm not gonna. Um, and we have a fantastic um, uh, Becky Williams who does all of our. Um, public defense connection between people who need a lawyer and uh, uh, qualify. Uh, she's just a rock star. She's fantastic. I can't, I can't, uh, Angie can speak to it, but she puts in 
so much extra work. I met with her right before this meeting to just say, you know, where are we at and where are we at in real time and what hearings do we need to set. She's she's great. So we have a really good, I would say, um, local team in collaboration. Uh, but man, it is it is week to week, and every time I see her, she's like. And I'll get this email like, hey, do you have five minutes? Or if something came up, I'm just like, oh, let's read Becky. Where will she not find me in the building? <laughs> um, but we you know we've managed to work through it, but it is it is skinny, it's tight. Um, so yeah, that's that's the that's the update. Say the legislative session. More, more fodder for the legislative session. Interesting. Anything to be done for legislation? Yeah, I mean, you know, the other thing too is, you know, everybody, um, all of our groups, Bend Attorney Group, um, Issues to Defenders, and Atlas Law Group, all um, successfully went through the contract process. So just received those, um, those uh, emails the other day. So, you know, that's that's great. I know that there has been some you know, resource committed to that, but uh, you can't you can't manufacture, you know, attorneys, and you can't just you know say okay. I was going to go back to uh, you know, two hundred fifty thousand to put you into a home in the band, right? Those are those are tough things that everybody, yeah, in our community faces, small business and government, everybody. Well, there's some big UGB expansions in Bend. There's uh, land available in Lapine. Redmond's building houses still, so uh, we're we are very tight path for housing right now. Right. Any questions about public defense? It doesn't sound like uh, we're in as bad shape as um, communities are around the state. I'll, I'll take our current situation. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> but I would say that even the counties that are just at the edge, like I'd say, she probably is, it's just it's one retiring attorney, one attorney leaving town, and they totally. That's yeah. it. You know, nobody is better off than that, and a lot of counties don't. Have Right, it's, it's that skinny. It's it's that skinny. Yeah. But there, I mean, the, the legislature did devote a lot of money, and um, through a lot of efforts from all, all all kinds of sources to really recruit. There's been success in adding. I mean, they're they're not necessarily everywhere you need them, but there's um, like there there are more attorneys on contract this year than there were last year. And that's continued to grow a little bit, but um, slow, slow down. I think the one other thing we're seeing is people are starting to stabilize now because just a year ago, people are just kind of just bopping around, you know, leaving uh, jobs and moving around, demanding more money. I'm gonna leave this so I can get more money there, which is fine, but I think it's just starting to stabilize. We saw this at 911 floor, 24 hour operations. We couldn't get the next, half a dozen people in there no matter what we did but all of a sudden you know staffing levels are stabilizing uh health department and sheriff's office are both like that too there's just constant openings but i think we're starting to see it stabilize so hopefully we can build on that because last year we were going backwards as fast as we were trying to do that thing Yeah, she said court updates. I don't know yet. We we have some real, yeah. real quick court updates. Um, Judge Kirk, so you want to talk really quickly about the uh, DI committee? Oh, yeah. So we formed a DI committee uh, for back in April. So, of course, uh, is that about April? April? And so we've had now uh, so several. Um, meetings together to kind of get up, get up to speed. One of the, we've had numerous community members um, who helped to facilitate it along with court staff. And uh, we, last month, we got together finally um, to kind of address some of the things that we think um, the court needs to address. We'll be uh, getting together on the 23rd from this month to uh, kind of work through some of those things. And uh, it was formed to make recommendations to the presiding judge and to the trial court administrator, and also to contemplate what kind of work that uh, the committee could do as well to assist. 
So I'm excited about it. I think it, you know, lots of good things can come out. One of the things that I'm amazed at, we also did a strategic planning work group um, a couple of weeks ago. And a number of those things that came up in our strategic planning work group are also things that uh, came up in our DEI uh, work session. So I think you know those are aligning, and it's really nice to see. And you know, I'm excited about um, what can be done with that. And it's about at this point 16 folks that are on it at this point. Obviously, you could have more people on it. Um, and there are a couple of groups that I think that we would like to see on it that are not represented right now. We have reached out to them, hopefully in the future. We would also, be, having a committee like this also presents a certain amount of um, issues with regards to how big it can be because at a certain level it becomes on you. And so that's, you know, that's the other thing that I think we need to control that. It's a DEI committee. It's important to have diversity and agree and inclusion. So that's that's you know that's what we need to do. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Angie, can you talk a little bit about case clearance rates? Yes, okay, so I'll keep this brief. But um, I know there's a lot of advocacy um, in partnership with the county to get our two additional judicial positions, and just wanted to share a little bit about the fruit of that effort. In addition to having Judge McKeever and Judge Harriet join the bench, which is so wonderful, and we're also seeing it in case resolution. So we talked about the COVID backlog, and Deschutes County continued to be pretty assertive about resolving cases even throughout the pandemic. But as of July, our we were clearing, um, closing more cases than were filed in every case type except civil. And that was because our civil filings had increased by 21% over the year prior. So it wasn't that we were closing cases. We actually closed, for example, 16% um, more cases than civil cases than the year prior, but the filings were up. So those two additional judicial positions, the two additional dockets we created are allowing us to um, resolve cases and address any backlog we may have developed during that pandemic. And one of, one of the things that was really helpful is, you know, for at least a decade, you know, we were just uh, under resourced and we couldn't look at data with any confidence and say, okay, here, you know, here's where we're strong, here's where we're weak, um, and, and develop priorities. What we knew and what we did was we knew the case in front of us needed to be handled. And so it was fairly reactive. And, you know, we had an analyst uh, who went through, it was nearly completed data cleanup, thousands of cases. So we can really begin to have confidence in that data and make decisions about, um, hey, not just saying like, boy, those you know those numbers are really pretty, but boy, those are those numbers are kind of spooky, and we need to do better. And we can look at our business process and and also uh, you know one of the things we're going to do here in the next week or so is put together a work group. You know, we want to uh, take this construction time as an opportunity to explore uh, better and different ways to kind of experiment with how we're uh, going to do our work. You know, our our footprint's going to shrink even more. So it's like, how do we continue to serve our community, not expand the security footprint and cost for the county by saying like, hey, you know, uh, Lisa, this is a beautiful building. Let's try to use this space and get creative about better work. And then when we come out of the construction to say, what did we like? What worked? What didn't work? What do we want to keep? And, you know, what was fun to kind of try, but let's put it put it back on the rack. So uh, that's kind of the quick thing. I'm not sure if any, any of the judges want to talk about some things that are kind of going on in the courts and updates. Now, the, the one thing I would say, and I'll circle back to treatment court, and uh, Commissioner here and I have spoken about this, is there's always been a need for an inpatient treatment program here in Central Oregon as it relates to treatment court. And the reason why that's important and critical is because under the treatment court model, you're not supposed to put people in jail if you have substance use disorder. And part of that also relates to the criminogenic thinking is that when you take trying to treat those issues, you put them in jail, they meet people who are also high risk and have criminogenic thinking. And what the model tells you is that if you put high risk people or low risk people with high risk people, they make them high risk people. But if you've got high risk people dealing with high risk people, they continue to be high risk people. And so, and it doesn't, and so one of the things that at times occurs is you get someone who is initially in the program who is suffering from substance use disorder and 
will not stop using. And so one of the things that treatment courts do, or courts do, is put them in jail to, and to get them to stop. There are two things that are problematic with it. One, um, in, in putting them in jail, um, I address that in terms of meeting other folks and doing that. But the other part of it is, in jail, it takes about 45 days for a person, is what they tell you, to kind of begin to change, their physiology begins to change to get weaned off and have their, um, their thinking begin to change. And so it's not the right way to treat someone in treatment court to put them in jail for 45 days if you're a treatment program, right? And so that's why the, the need is there for an actual treatment, inpatient treatment program to address those issues. So it's been a long-standing issue. Um, I've had this conversation, I think, with Commissioner Adair, and I think with Commissioner Chang as well. And so that's one of the critical parts, I think, of any um, treatment program is finding. And we've had to find ways to, creative ways to deal with people coming in who's had these issues and try to address their inpatient needs other than trying to put them in jail for a substantial amount of time to get them to stop using it. Uh, looks like the whole crew is here now. Is that correct? Yes. All the judges. So thank you Sorry. very much. No, it's exciting. Well, having everybody together. I was going to mention, um, based on Judge Crutchley's you know, thinking, is um, one of the trainings I went to recently. So I was just in a shelter hearing for dependency court. And uh, I went to a training recently, and one of the technical assistance opportunities that's provided through the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges is service mapping. So they provide free technical assistance on service mapping for the community. And so that's um, my next event horizon on abuse and neglect cases is to connect with them and request technical assistance so that we have a specific service map because it's problematic. And I think what Judge Crutchley's run into in, in his his court, I mean, dependency court isn't really a specialty court. It's, it's kind of run like a specialty court. It's just a Kind of a subset of all the stuff that we do but um really what we run into is is really a significant deficit in services available to assist our parents and so you know historically oregon has a really very very high removal rate of children as opposed to maintaining in home placements or having you know, some sort of safety service provision um, we're making a lot of progress um, with with I guess, diminishing the number of removals. But the problem with that is, is the services available to make children safely in home. And we were, our findings were down until this last month. And we've had a significant number of uh, fentanyl addicted uh, infants born within the last 60 days. Um, and so in terms of service provision for uh, pregnant and parenting uh, families, that are uh, substance use affected, uh, that's a significant problem. And we're seeing the babies, you know, like I think we have at this point in the last, the last two months, we have like, I think five babies in care right out the gates that were born um, positive fentanyl. Um, and, and what's being reported from medical professionals is like the, the withdrawals are so much more painful that the kiddos are in NICU for longer um, with greater administration of pain medication, the disorder of eating and feeding, like, like much more than has been historically, right? Um, and then the problem with maintaining in home is safety provisions around fentanyl. Um, and what a lot of professionals will be reporting in court, which is found to be true, um, is that it, it's lethal through you know hand-to-hand -hand contact even. And so maintaining safety in home of an infant or a small child when there's active fentanyl use is really, really challenging. So all this to say is that is something that I want to look at as service mapping to our families, because even in cases where you don't have significant substance use involvement presenting in the in court, you have a ton of other um, problems, you know, vocational skill building, housing, um, employment, and like really it's just the opportunity to teach people life skills. And those aren't oftentimes a jurisdictional basis, but it's oftentimes a significant deficit in their ability to access services or even figure out what it means to be referred to a service, even if the service existed. 
So like, and we had Don's house closed recently um, for various reasons. You know, we have one pregnant parenting, um, shelter housing, grandma's house. You know, like if, if we can really look at opportunities for safe and stable sober living, that would go a very long way to help the families that you know, we're seeing um, crossing over with court in so many different case types. And one of the major roles that the juvenile analyst plays is, is scooping up all of the co-occurring cases for these families, right? Like you'll have their criminal case, their FAPA case, their always sometimes a stalking case, plus their domestic relations case, plus their juvenile case, right? And so it's like, if you look at resource investment on these types of families, it's significant because they're crossing over all of these different patterns of behaviors, right? And so um, from my perspective, you know, we're going to start with the service mapping just to see what is there, how often we can update it so that we're all on the same page about how are we, how are we meeting the needs of these families? Um, because then after we do that, my goal would be like, okay, getting together with ODHS Child Welfare locally and saying, okay, how can we fill needs locally through our community service providers or coming together in community and figuring out how we can meet the needs? Um, which I think is of interest to you guys in terms of how this is playing out with the cost of medical, criminal justice, all of it. It kind of, I think all of the rubber hits the road oftentimes in that, that zone. Um, so just to play off of what Judge Fauci was saying is, you know, having opportunities for local service provision would be a tremendous assistance to the families that we're seeing. So. Some good information in there, some scary information too. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, I feel like I heard the, the about the need for two different kinds of residential treatments. Yeah, I mean residential treatment definitely makes we for yeah, you know, I think best care has just uh, opened like a, a mom's program. I'm not familiar with that. It's fairly new emergence that I've been seeing. I'm not sure. I don't think it's residential, but it's best care mom's program. Don't know what that means. So I gotta look into that piece. But oftentimes, like the mommy and me programs for um, you know, infant mom co placements are going to be out of Klamath Falls um, or someplace in the valley, or for our indigenous families, they'll go out east. Um, so, you know, nothing really local in terms of inpatient residential or parenting. Um, individuals, moms and dads, um, and so that's that's a huge issue. And then, of course, you know, before even having these kiddos safe and stable, sober living for for individuals that we're we're addressing, babies not being born drug affected. And so the the there's a difference between res, inpatient residential treatment program and so and so clean and sober housing. So for treatment court, when you come in, lots of folks they're using. And one of the requirements of the treatment court, obviously, is that you not use, but they, and lots of them may not have housing. So you need to find a place for them to um, live clean and sober. And so they have certain, like uh, um, Dawn's house is one of those. Um, the uh, Bend Recovery Hall is one of those, um, is one of those. So you have to have places to have people go where they're not. And you know, generally, they're tested in, in these facilities to make sure that they're and they can't bring in um, drugs into these um, facilities. So it would be nice to have something that we could depend on. The, 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 the trouble for treatment court is at times there may not be enough space to get it. Bethlehem Inn is a clean and uh, sober housing facility, and folks can check into it at times. Um, and so, but it's, it would be nice to have a place where we can have people go for clean and sober housing. Sometimes we have to be scrambling to see whether or not there's a bed available, you know, a place available. So when you were when you were saying rather than rather than um, putting someone in jail um, for for that forty five day period, you were actually that you. Uh, you're both talking about clean and sober living opportunities more than a residential treatment facility. Well, no, I was really referring to at that point a re an inpatient residential okay. treatment program okay. because at that point, what you're getting at is people are continuing to use uh, substances, and 
essentially in violation of their probation, right? So, and for that purpose, they can be violated on their probation and sent to jail. Or while they're picked up on uh, probation, they can be, for that violation, they can be sent to jail while their hearing is pending. And so if they're in treatment court, what we don't want to do is necessarily send them to jail just for using. And in fact, I tell them, I will never send you to jail just for using drugs. If you've done everything else, because this is a treatment program, we do not put you in jail just for using. But if they're, needing, if they're in need of treatment and they're not being honest, and we have no other option but to put them in jail, I'm saying, okay. And I've reluctantly done that, I think, once or twice just to have a place to put them. And it's not the best thing to do by all standards for treatment courts. It's not what you should be doing. More inpatient residential is necessary uh, would be right to address that. Got it. And one of the interesting things about jail when people think about putting folks in jail for substance use disorder, you wouldn't think so, but they have actually maybe better access to drugs in jail than they do on the, on the street at times. So that's the other issue. Well, I spoke to the jail captain today. He says right after they uh, got stabilized and uh, got the flashlights out, they did a bed check real quick and nobody got out. But uh, what a moment today with the power going out. Okay, well, on that note, uh, maybe we can wrap up here. We've got another step to go this evening if we'd like to. So anything else? That's our agenda for this evening. Thank you for um, inviting us today. Thank you always for showing care and concern about the work that we do for justice and supporting justice in our community. It's yeah. greatly appreciated and we notice it. So thank you. Thank you. We will be upstairs at Michigan Brewery. Um, we have the room reserved and uh, food will be on the court. And then if you want adult beverages, those would get you on your own, but we can buy iced tea. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was a little cryptic before. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, not a problem. <laughs> Did I do it all? New technology.